All right. Now, last time we talked about related rates. What's the idea? Well, you're given some rate of change. Now, whenever you hear the word rate of change, and in particular, whenever you hear this word rate, you say, aha, derivative. Because derivatives are measuring rates of change, how fast something is changing. So this is a key word when it tells us that we have a rate of change or that it has something to do with the derivative. OK, so we're given a rate of change, or our derivative, and we want to find another hopefully related rate of change, or hopefully re related derivative. Now, it has to be related because if they're unrelated to one another, you can't say anything. So there's some relationship. Maybe it's a circle, and you're asked to find, well, how is the area of the circle changing with the radius? Well, are the area of a circle and the radius related? Yeah. So it makes sense to say that as one is changing, the other is changing. And we should be able to say something about how the rates relate to one another. Now, generally speaking, three steps. The first step is to say, all right, I have two things, or maybe even more, but two things I'm trying to relate to one another. So what I'm first going to do, I'm not going to worry about the rates. I'm just going to say, OK, I have these things. How do I relate them to one another? And you find an equation that relates them to one another. And I would say probably this is the hardest part of any problem, is setting up this relationship. Because oftentimes when you see these related rates problems, it'll be kind of a word problem. They won't even give you names for variables. It'll just be a story. And we have to sort of translate the story into our, our math language. So that takes practice. But fortunately, you get to do homework on this. So you get practice. Woohoo! Next week. All right. All right. Now, after we've found the relationship between the variables, well, I, I'm not looking for the relationship. I'm looking for how the derivatives relate. So I take the derivative of both sides. Now, here the trick is, what's the, deriv what's the variable we take the derivative of? It's not x or y. It's almost always going to be time, which I'll just call t. So usually when we're talking about rate of change, how is something changing with time? So probably every problem you're going to encounter will be derivative with respect to time t. And then we solve for the desired quantity. Because what we'll have is we'll have information about one rate. Now we have an equation which relates to two rates. And then we solve for the rate that we want. OK? So we're going to practice this. And we'll do a couple more of these today. Because we're finishing up chapter three today. And we're going to start up with chapter four. So we didn't get to finish the problem last time. So let's recap the problem. So this was. We had a, a, uh, a cup. You'll sometimes see these next to the uh, water coolers. These are like paper little cups made out of cones. And uh, so we have this cup. It's four inches high, three inches ac across at the top. And you fill it with water. But after you fill it with water, lo and behold, you discover that, that there was a manufacturing defect as a whole, making this a holy cup. So the water is leaking out the bottom. So the water is, is going out. So the volume is changing. Now, being the kind of mathematician you are, you start to look at this for a second. And you notice that when the height of the water is 2 inches, the rate that the water is dropping, you can measure it, is a half inch per minute. And how fast is the volume changing? Now, first off, we should translate some of these statements. So we need to identify things that we're interested in. So what's the given? Or I should say, what are the quantities that we're trying to relate? So, well, when we ask how fast is something changing. So this is one of the quantities we're trying to relate, is the volume. We'll usually call it v. We're not very creative, v for volume. The other thing we're trying to relate is the height, because that's what we're given. We're given some information about the height. So the first thing we're going to do is pick out the variables that we're trying to relate to one another. All right, we pick them out, h and v. Now we keep translating. All right, what else do we know? Well, we're told something about what happens when the height is 2. So when h equals 2, so that's this statement, what do we know? We know something about how the water is changing. It's dropping a half inch per minute. Now, how do I translate this statement? Well, dropping, is that positive or negative? Yeah, negative. We think of it going down. Now, this is a rate. You can see it's a rate because it has this you know, something over time. Usually when you see something over time, it's a rate. So it's a rate. What's the, what it's a rate of? It's a rate of height. It's telling me something about how height is changing. So that statement is telling me something about the hdt. 
And in particular, it tells us the HDT is negative a half. Now let me pause here for a second. One thing I, I didn't emphasize at the last class, it helps some people and confuses others, so I'll, I'll try it here. If you, if you don't like it, forget it right away. What's our variable? Our variable is t. So really, when I think of these functions, h, it's really a function of time. I could think of this as a function h of t, and I could think of this as a function b of t. So when I'm taking derivatives, that's why I need to keep using my chain rule, because everything is a function of t. I'm not taking derivatives with respect to h or respect to b. I'm taking it with respect to t. So always think of these functions as functions of time. So I'm not saying that h is this function 2. I'm saying that when there's some h, there's some time so that the height is 2, and at that time, this dh dt is negative a half. I actually don't know what the function h of t is, because so it probably will, will change depending upon what's happening. So remember, always think of these as functions of time. We'll always will suppress the of t. But if you want, you can write it down. But it, with a little bit of practice, it's redundant. We don't need it. OK. So what we've done now is we've translated. I want to re relate db dt, because db dt is how fast it's changing. That's a rate. Whenever you see the word like rate or changing, that tells us what we want. So we want to find dv dt. OK, so now we've translated this into something which for us makes a lot more sense. We've translated it into our math terminology. Now if I just erase all this and I say, well, when h of t equals 2 and dh dt equals negative a half, how fast is, what is dv dt, given that we have in a relationship for volume and height? Now, I haven't talked about that. The one thing I, I haven't spelled out yet is what's the relationship? So we dig deep. We dig so deep that we have to turn into the front page of our book, and we find this equation for a cone. And the equation for the cone tells us that the volume of a cone is 1 third times pi times r squared times h, where h is the height from the tip to wherever you're measuring, and r is the radius. Now, now we have a relationship for the volume of water. The volume of water is certainly related to this variable h, but there's a catch. We have this r. We haven't said anything about r in this statement. So somehow we have to figure out how to handle this r. So that's the real work of this problem, is figuring out what do we do with it. OK. That's no, not such a hard problem. What do we do? Well, we think, well, let's just take a slice right through the middle of this cup. Hopefully not when we're trying to do the measurement. Otherwise, we'll you know, spill water all over the place. But OK, if I take a slice, I see that the cone now becomes just a triangle. And that if I look at where the water is, here's the water. And I call this an H and this R. I say, well, look, I have some triangles here. I have this triangle which relates h and r. But at the same time, I have this other triangle that's similar to it. So that this triangle that relates h and r is similar to this other triangle that it's inside of. Now when I say similar, I just mean that they're related by scaling to one another. So two triangles are similar if I can scale one to get the other. All right. Well, why is that useful? It's useful because in similar triangles, the ratios of sides always agree. So if I have two triangles which are similar, and I look at the corresponding ratios of two sides, I always get the exact same quantity. And that's useful because now what I can do is I can relate this r to this h, the ratio of r to h, which we just write as r over h, to the length of this side to this side. And what makes this really useful is we actually know what this side is. And we know what that side is. It's 3 halves and 4. Or, if you like this part, it's 3 eighths. So r divided by h, that ratio will always be 3 eighths. And so we can conclude that r is 3 eighths times h. Now we're in business. What do we do? We come back to our volume equation. Volume is 1 third pi r squared h. We say, OK, well, we wanted to get rid of the r, and now we can. I can replace r using this relationship here. So I write it down. 1 third pi, 3 eighths h, quantity squared, times h. OK. And that's where we finished last time. Whew. Took us a while to get there. 
Now we have to finish up the problem. OK, well, what's our next step? Well, probably our next step is let's just simplify this before we go much further. 1 third pi times 9 over 64 times h cubed. But of course, I can take the 1 third and I can divide it into the 9, so I'll just uh, write that as 3 over 64. OK, so now all that work was step 1. I found my relationship between the variables. OK. So now we go to step two. I'm going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. Because what's going on here is really what I have is I have volume as a function of t is pi times 3 over 64 times this h, which is a function of t as well, cubed. Now we usually suppress this of t notation. But remember, everything is a function of time. So now I'm going to take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. So, uh, Sorry, I like to suppress this notation. So what's the derivative of v with respect to t? Yeah, it's the derivative of v with respect to t. Not a very profound question. We don't know what it is, so we just write dv dt. OK, pi is a constant. 3 over 64 is a constant. So I can just pull them out. Now, how do I take the derivative of h cubed? What rule do I need to use? I need to use the chain rule. In fact, I, I use this very special case. Oh, ah! I use this very special case. Like Paul. We'll go back and edit out that part at the very beginning. OK. So the rule says bring 3 down in front. OK, all right. The rule says bring 3 down in front. The h stays the same on the inside. Now you just subtract one from the power up here. Times by the derivative of the inside. What's the derivative of h? dh dt. Now, it's the now, of course, the answer of what's the derivative of h, it does depend upon what's the derivative we're taking with respect to. If I was asking what's the derivative of h with respect to h, that's 1. But here I'm taking the derivative with respect to t. Now, how do I know I'm taking the derivative with respect to t? Way back here. You see this dt in the bottom? This tells us what I'm taking the derivative of with respect to. It says take the derivative of h with respect to t. That's how you read this. Take the derivative of v with respect to t. So t is the variable taking the derivative with respect to. And so the derivative of h with respect to t, well, it's just simply what we call dh dt. OK, that's our second step. That means we're 2 thirds of the way there. Woohoo! Yes. Very exciting. OK. Now what's left? is we just come back and we plug in what we know. We know the h that we're interested in is when, at the time, h equals 2. And we know dh dt at that time is negative 1 half. So we plug all this in. So we get, if we do this, hopefully we can fit it on the board, dv dt is pi times 3 over 64 times, this is a really big time sign, 3 times h squared, h squared is 2 squared, times dh dt, which is negative 1 half. OK, so 2 squared is 4 times negative 1 half is negative 2, times 3 times 3. Uh, that'll be negative 18, so we get, oh, well, OK, hold on. So this 2 cancels with that. We have a negative. We'll put that in front. 2 goes into 64, 32 times, so I get pi 9 over 32. So negative pi times 9 over 32. All right, what are the units? Yeah, inches cubed per minute. Now, we could just say, well, that's what we expect, because our measurement here was in inches. Everything was being measured in inches, and our time was minutes. And we hopefully should just automatically should pop out. And the moral of the story is, as long as you do it right, it does automatically pop out. But we can actually identify where everything comes from. Number, 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 those don't have units. Where are the units of h? h is in inches, because we talked about 2 inches. So this is inches. What's the units of dh dt? 
inches per minute. Now here, it's really inches squared because it's h squared. So notice I have inches squared times another set of inches gives me my inches cubed. And then I have my over minutes. So the units will always do what you expect them to do, as long as you did the problem right. OK. Yes? Because the HDT is negative. Unfortunately, because of my bad handwriting here, it looks like the negative, then I should put a big space over 1 half. But because it was dropping. Everyone understand this one? Yes? Good? Woohoo! OK, should we do some, some more? Yeah! That's the kind of excitement I like. Someone was bold enough to say, yeah! OK. Now, the next test is going to be so exciting because we can do this kind of word problem, and we're going to have some more kinds of word problems. We could have like two word problems on one test. Awesome! Now, I will say that the hardest part about these related rates problems is almost always setting up the relationship. The good news is there's not that many things that they'll ask you for. So, as you, you know, the Pythagorean theorem is a useful one to know. A uh, similar triangle shows up. The area of squares, areas of circles, volumes of circles, vo sorry, volumes of spheres. Very basic things. OK. All right. Well, I have two more examples I can do. I'm trying to think. I want to tell a good story. Let me start with the one with the good story. OK. So you're late. Uh, it's late. It's Friday night. You've been hanging out with your friends. You've been doing calculus homework, having a ton of fun, taking derivatives, finding your tangent lines. And you come home, and lo and behold, as you pull into the driveway, you see your wife there. And she is not happy. <laughs> no, she is not. And she's standing there. She's 12 feet away from this wall, just waiting with her arms crossed for you to pull into the driveway. And here is your car. It's not a very good car. You're a college student. <laughs> so you're pulling in. And, and you notice here that you can tell right away that your wife, she's not happy with you. But you don't notice that, because you're still in your calculus euphoria. So your beams here, you have your headlights on, and it's casting a shadow. And you can see the shadow here of your wife on the wall. And you think to yourself, wow, that's kind of cool. I wonder how fast is that shadow moving up the wall? Oh, OK. So you start thinking to yourself, so I'm moving. She's standing still. So I somehow want to relate my movement of my car to this movement of her shadow up the wall. So we need to measure some stuff. Now you think to yourself, I'm getting pretty close. I'm slowing down. So right now, I'm only 12 feet away from where she's standing currently. And I'm, I'm creeping in slowly because I know I, I want to delay the, the conversation. I'm only moving at three feet per minute towards her. And you also know some things about what's going on. For instance, the headlight to the ground is at two feet. And your wife, she's a wonderful woman, but she's not very tall. Five feet. Although my wife claims she's five foot one, five feet. It's much easier. Five feet one makes it harder. OK. So here's our question. We have our picture. So question, how fast is her shadow moving up the wall? OK. All right, that's what we want to figure out. So let's see. First off, we need to start assigning some variables. And then we want to relate, because we want to relate things that change. This 12 feet, that's fixed. That 5 feet, that's fixed. This 2 feet, that's fixed, unless you get a flat tire all this time. But we'll assume it's, it's, it's fixed. So what's changing? Well, what's changing is this 12 feet. Well, if that's something that's changing, we should give it a name. We can get, call it whatever you want. Anybody have a favorite name? X. OK, X is very popular. All right, we will call this x. So we're interested in what's happening when x equals 12, right? Just from the picture. But of course, x is changing. It's not a fix at 12. What does this tell us here? 
this three feet per minute, how do we interpret that? Yeah, it's a rate. In particular, what rate is it? It's how x is changing. So what do we know about dx dt? Is it 3? It's, it's almost 3. It's negative 3. Now, why is it negative 3? Because this distance is getting smaller, because I'm moving towards. I, shouldn't, I probably shouldn't personify it. The car is moving towards the person over there. OK. All right. So it's decreasing. So it's negative 3. All right. So now we know dx dt is negative 3. Now, what's the other thing we have to relate? Well, th the other thing we have to relate is, of course, the question is, what are we looking for? We're looking for how fast. The so fast is another way to say rate. So again, we can say this is what we're looking for. It's a derivative, the shadow. So we should assign a variable to that length there. How, what do you want to call that one? Y. OK, that's a good one. Y. OK, so I want to relate x to y. How do I do it? Well, I look at my picture here. And if I was a much better artist, sorry for this. Whoosh, OK, I would have done a better job of doing this. OK, obviously my picture is bad. <laughs> but the, all our math will be good, so we'll get the right answer. All right, so imagine I, I were to beam send a light straight out of my headlight towards the wall. And I have, what do I have? I really have some triangles here. And I really have two triangles which are similar to one another. Can you see that? So let's start labeling the sides. OK, I should use a different color so we can actually pick stuff out that's useful. What's the length of this side of this triangle? It's 12, because it's 12 feet. What's this length? Mind you, not to scale. It's 3 feet. Why? Because total height is 5 feet, but I cut it out 2 feet. So this is length 2 feet, so this is 3 feet. So as, you, as I said, not to scale. So this is moral. Don't trust my drawing. OK. That art class I took in college didn't pay off. All right, 3 and 12. Now what is this big length here? Which is this length here? Well, oh wait, I shouldn't call this 12. This is x, I'm sorry. Because this is the one that's changing. So we should call it what it is when it's changing. What's the total length here? Yeah, it's this 12 plus x, yeah. And finally, what's this height here? Well, the total height of her shadow is y, but we're taking off two feet, so y minus two. So now I do the same thing I just did, similar triangle. So what we do is we take the height, y minus two, divided by, so this height here, divided by this length here, which is 12 plus x, is the same as the following ratio, this height here, divided by that length there. 3 over x. Yeah? Good? OK, now I could start from here, but let's see if we can't make it look nicer, make it look cleaner. All right, suppose I asked you to solve for y. What would you do? OK, now silence is not the best thing to do. In fact, it's a really bad strategy, especially on midterms. If I want to get y by itself, the real thing is I want to get that 12 plus x over. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by 12 plus x. So 3 times 12 plus x divided by x. And then I can move the, the minus 2 over as a plus 2. Now, right now, if I saw this, what rule would I think to use? I would think to use a quotient rule, but what do we know about the quotient rule? We hate the quotient rule, so let's try to avoid it. Can I rewrite this so I don't have to use the quotient rule? Well, think of this as 36 plus 3x in the top. And what I can do is I can break it up. 
Namely, I can write this as 36 over x plus 3x over x plus 2. So the plus 2 came from there. And then I'm just writing 36 over x plus 3x over x. This is one of those cool rules you learn in arithmetic. Now, notice what happens here. x over x, they cancel off. And so this just becomes 36 over x, or if you like, 36 times x to negative 1 plus 5. Now, that's not bad. And you're thinking to yourself, this is good. I can probably finish this problem before I actually have to stop the car. All right. Now, that's step one. What's our next step? Yeah, step two. Take derivative. So let me write back y again. So y is 36 times x negative 1 plus 5. So dy dt is equal to 36 times, and what's the derivative of x to negative 1? Yeah, bring the negative 1 down, x to negative 2. And the derivative of plus 5 is 0, because the derivative of a constant is 0. That's, that's our rule way up in the, in the far corner. Or if you like, this is negative 30. Oh, whoops, wait, what? I forgot one other thing. What else do I need? dx dt, because I'm taking the derivative with respect to time. So I'm taking the left-hand side, take that derivative with respect to t, and I take the right-hand side, take that derivative with respect to t. So now I have this relationship between dy dt and dx dt. Now, if I can rearrange this, let me just play around with it for a second. This is the same as negative 36 divided by x squared times dx dt. So now I know what dy dt. dy dt is equal to this expression here. So that was part two. What's part three? Well, you solve, because you just plug in what you know, and hopefully you've actually figured out all these quantities. You've figured out the relationship. You know the numbers. And let's hope that this is true in our case. dy dt is equal to negative 36. OK, what's the x that we're interested in? Yeah, because we're interested in what happens when x is 12. So when we're 12 feet away, how fast is the shadow moving? So we plug in x equals 12. So 12 squared. What is dx dt? Negative 3. OK, so the two negatives cancel out. 36 is 3 times 12. So I can pull this out, have a 3, and I cancel off one of the 12s in the denominator. So you get 9 over 12 or 3 over 4. And what are the units? Any guesses? Feet per minute. So that tells us that the height this shadow is moving at that particular time, it's moving at 3 fourths feet per minute, or if you like, 9 inches per minute. Good? Yes? Mm -hmm. But x is a distance from, from the wife, not from the wall. I mean, we could set it up so x is a distance from the wall, but then we have to, it's just a matter of changing your variables around, doing some mumble jumble, we'll set it up with three fourths. But you'll change your equations here in the meantime. So. So it depends on how you define your variables. It's one of the fun parts about these problems is, is how do you define your variables? And you can define them differently. OK, so we can do another one of these or move on to chapter 4. OK, there's no excitement. This, oh, yes? It is a right triangle. Yeah. But even for. Most of the time when you do these problems, you'll, you'll deal with right triangles. But even if it weren't a right triangle, the similar triangles rule still applies, which is nice. But yeah, in this case, it was a right triangle. If I'd made the wall out of slant, then uh, too confusing. OK. All right. So we'll move on to chapter four then. We'll, we'll, put, the, we'll put the board question on for later. It was going to be so good, too.
Okay. All right. So now we start chapter four. So chapter three is all about derivatives. How do you take derivatives? What is a derivative? What's the definition? How do you find the derivative of a function? Well, we have a limit. Okay, limits are hard. Let's get rid of it. All right, no problem. We'll sign some rules. And so we spent a lot of time finding the rules, which are all these rules. And then we did some various things. We did uh, implicit differentiation and uh, related rates. So there, here are some very simple applications. But really in chapter four, now we're starting to some more of our hardcore applications. But we're going to start chapter four with section 4.1. And uh, pretty much this, this section is called linear approximations. But uh, we, we essentially have already built up the intuition. So all the intuition for today it can be summed up as following, just as tangent lines are good. That's section 4.1. Now, I should be a little bit more specific. I should say tangent lines are good near point of tangency. So in other words, I have my function. My function, I might be trying to understand it. If I just care about what's happening near a point of tangency and I have my tangent line, the tangent line will be good near that point of tangency. And that's really all section 4.1 is talking about. OK, so what's the picture? Let me grab these colored markers here. So I need to get some new colored markers. OK, so here's my function y equals f of x. And I have a point A. And I look at my tangent line. And here's the tangent line to f of x at x equals a. Now, on the very first day of class, we talked about how if you zoom in closer and closer, the function looks more and more like the tangent line. And really, that's what we're starting with today. So what might I want to know? Well, I might want to know the following. Suppose I, I know what happens at A, but I don't want to know what happens at A, but something nearby A. So I want to have, know what happens over here at this point. Well, I say, well, look, the tangent line, I know that, and lines are easy, and I can tell you where that is on the tangent line. So here's the value of the tangent line. Here's the value of the function. And you'll notice that they're fairly close to one another. And this is the moral. Tangent lines are good. They make great approximations for our function. In particular, if I think about what's happening here, here is f of a. Let's, let's call this for a second here x. Here is f of a plus x. Then this distance here, this change, we call this delta f. It's the change in the actual value of the function. This change down here, we call this delta x. It's the change in the x coordinate. And we're using the delta. This is the Greek letter delta. That helps when you join fraternities and sororities. You get to learn all these fun Greek letters. Delta, lambda. Let's see. What are some other fun ones? This one probably doesn't get used very often. Do people know this one? See? Yeah? Do you know the lowercase? <laughs> it's a squiggle. Yeah, fun Greek letters. OK, so delta, just think of it as a small change. Just like d. d. The intuition of d is it's like a small, almost instantaneous rate of change. Almost infinitely small, but that's technically not what it is. But that's how you think of it. Delta is, is a very small, but it's actually still measurable. OK, so here, you'll notice that the change in f, well, if I looked at the tangent line and see how that compares, you'll see it's very close. So. Remember what f prime is. Uh, where can I write? I'll write over here. f prime of, uh, let me write a. Limit as h goes to 0, f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Where, uh, let me write the other definition down. This other definition will make it more clear. h goes to 0. Instead of f of a, you can do f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Either one of these gives you the right definition. They're, they're essentially the same. It's just how you call your, call your variables. 
the f of x minus f of a, this is my change in f, x minus a, this is my change in x. So that for a small change in f or a small change in x, it's approximately f prime of a. Or a small change in f is approximately f prime of a times delta x. Now, if you think about what this is, f prime of a is your slope. It's rise over run. Delta x is how much you run. So if this is a rise over run, and this is a run, and if I multiply these together, what do I get? I get a rise, yeah. So f prime of a times delta x is essentially saying how much does it change on the tangent line. If I use the tangent line to figure out how much it changes. And this delta f is saying how much does the actual function change. And so the moral is they're pretty close, near the point of tangency. OK, so that's our, our, me our message for today. Now, what do I mean? Well, a long time ago, way back before you were born, people didn't have calculators. I know, it's amazing, it's true. They actually had to do math by hand. And so sometimes it, it's very hard to get numbers exactly. Like you say, suppose I ask you, what's the square root of 26? You say, I don't know, function my calculator. OK. But suppose you didn't have a calculator, and I asked you what the square root of 26 is. You say, oh, I don't know how to find that. I say, well, maybe I don't need the exact value of the square root of 26. But can you tell me approximately what the square root of 26 is? Give me a good estimate. Give me a good feel for what it should be. Say, ah, oh, OK. Well, I know square root of 26 is you know, it's close to square root of 25, and then so 5. I say, oh, that's too easy. I want it better. I want it better than just 5. Give me something closer. And you're like, ah, oh, how am I supposed to do this? Can't believe it. Well, of course, uh, what we can say is, all right, well, how are square root of 26 and square root of 25 related? Well, they're both square roots. So if I start with my function, which is, say, square root of x, and I'm asking for how are square root of 26 and square root of 25 related? Well, if I understand the difference here, square root of 26 minus square root of 25, if I can get an, an estimate for how big this should be, then I can get a good estimate for what square root of 26 should be. OK. Well, think about it this way. This is like our delta f, our change in our value of our function. And our function would be square root of x. So on the bottom, if I think of this as 26 minus 25, we'll think of that as our delta x. What do we know? Delta f over delta x is approximately the derivative. OK. So let's think about the derivative here. What is the derivative of square root of x? Well, square root of x, another way to think of that is x to the half. So if I take the derivative, I would bring the half down in front, x to the minus a half. Or if you rewrite this as 1 over 2 times square root of x. OK. So the derivative is roughly 1 over 2 square root of x. And so we can say that f prime of 5, sorry, 25, well, we can actually compute that, because I can compute square root of 25. Square root of 25 is 5. 2 times 5 is 10. So that's 1 tenth. But this, really, if I think about this, this is really the same as it being an approximation for f prime of 25. Square root of 26 minus square root of 25 over 26 minus 25. So this is approximately 1 tenth. So that, if I look at it, the square root of 26 minus the square root of 25 is approximately 1 tenth. Well, if we just rewrite it, that says the square root of 26 is approximately square root of 25 plus a tenth. But square root of 25, we already know, is 5. So this is 5.1. So the square root of 26 is approximately 5.1. And if you were to take your calculator and plug it in, you see that that's actually not bad. It's a decent approximation. Now let me ask you this. Without actually putting it into your calculator, do you think that 5.1 is too high or too low? 
OK, so we have people who think both. Let's see if we can figure it out just by looking at the picture. Just get some feeling for it. Because I know what square root of x looks like. It looks like this. Oh, it looks like this. Here, it, let's say this is 5. 25. Here is 26. You can tell it's not to scale. Now, I'm using my tangent line. Now, essentially what I've done is I've used the tangent line to say that on the tangent line, I get the value 5.1. Here's the value 5. Now, looking at the picture, where should square root of 26 be? It should be below it. Here's 5.1, here's square root of 26. And you can see how the curve is bending. So you can actually use the shape of the curve to figure out whether or not your estimate is too high or too low. Um, that's something you don't need to worry about. That's just fun to think about. You'll do this in another class, I'm sure, or we might do it later. OK, what else can we say? Ah, yes, this is a fun one. I actually don't know what the answer of square root of 26 is, but it's a little bit less than 5.1. Does anybody have a calculator? I know that's cheating. No? OK, all right. It'll just be a mystery to us. We'll never know. The world will never know. 5.099. So 5.1 was not bad, and we were right. It was a little bit high. That's OK. Not bad. What's all? Now, we can also say something else with this. We can say that if I have a function, the change in the function, remember, is still f prime of a times the change in x. Now, sometimes what will happen is in manufacturing processes, you're not going to be able to build something exactly the right size. You can't build something precisely one inch. You'll always be off by a little bit. You can't make something exactly 10 feet long. There's going to be some error. It can be a small error or a big error. It depends upon how good your manufacturing process is. But there will always be an error. OK. So you might say, well, I know that there's an error. How can I say about how that's going to affect the range of what my values will be? Let me give an example. Suppose you're a, a pizza pie maker. You like pizza. And apparently, you like blue pizza. You have your pepperoni, blue pepperoni. Now, generally speaking, when you cook your pizza, you try to get your pizza to be 18 inches in diameter. But of course, you're not going to get a perfect circular pizza out. You're in, in fact, you can, you've measured, and over time, you've noticed that you are within a half inch of 18 inches. So you have this tolerance. I'm going to make an 18-inch pizza, but I'm not going to get exactly 18 inches out. But I'm always going to be within a half inch. Well, OK, so if you're, with your, within a half inch, what does that say about the, the area? I mean, how much could the area vary? We know how much the diameter can vary. How, how does that affect how much the area can vary? Because maybe if you make it you know, bigger than 18 inches, 18 and a quarter inches, you get more pizza than if you make it 17 and 3 quarters inches. OK, so here's a question. Let me write it down here. I'm sorry, my handwriting is getting really sloppy here. Uh, question, how much can our area vary? Or in other words, what's our tolerance for area? So this is the kind of question when you're building something, you may say, well, look, I have to have it within this range of tolerance. You say, all right, if you want it within this range of tolerance, you have to have your processes that build up to it have to be within so tight a range of tolerance for themselves. Well, let's think about our picture here. Now, I have a circle. So what's the relationship between the area of a circle and the diameter? Now, here, we're, we're, there's, there's a pause. People are trying to think back and say, oh, area is pi r squared. But, oh, wait. We're diameter. Shoot. Now we stop and think to ourselves, OK, what's the relationship between diameter and radius? Yeah, so diameter goes all the way across. Radius goes halfway across. So the radius is half the diameter. So the area is pi times a half the diameter squared. 
or if you like, the area is pi force d squared. All right, so that's my area. So now, according to my rule here, if I want to know how much my area can vary, well, I can get a good handle on it by looking at this. So my change in area, think of area as my function, is going to be approximately my derivative. Now, here, I'm thinking of a as a function of d. What's the derivative of a, a prime? Well, pi force is a constant. Then derivative of d squared will be 2d. I'm taking the derivative with respect to d. So pi halves d. So the change in area is approximately pi halves times your diameter times how much your diameter can vary. OK, well, in our case, we get pi halves. The diameter is 18. And then how much can it vary? Well, it can vary to be within plus or minus a half. And so that says us something if we just multiply these numbers out. So that's plus or minus. We got a pi, we got an 18, and a couple of twos. So that's 9 halves pi. And in our case, the units will be inches cubed. So it tells us that if we're within a half inch tolerance for the, the diameter of this pizza, that the area of the pizza will be roughly within 9 halves pi inches cubed. So pi is uh, 3.14159, so 27 over 2, something like 13.55 or something. So within 13 square uh, inches squared. <laughs> Sorry, this, this isn't a deep dish pizza. So it's within you know, 13 square inches. It might sound like a lot, but if you go back and you see compute how many inches are in this pizza, uh, pi r squared would be 240 something. So 240, you're within 13. OK, one last thing before you all pack up, because I know you want to get out of here. There's one last thing to talk about in section 401, which we'll talk about on Monday. But let me just summarize it really briefly. The book talks about linear approximation. Linear approximation means tangent line. So whenever you hear the word linear approximation, forget linear approximation and think tangent line. All right, don't forget to turn in your homework today. Have a good weekend. <laughs>